the word minister or pastor is a rather cheap identifier in society today. Any person with the slightest hint of religious inkling can stand up and declare themselves a spiritual leader. Even someone who wants to officiate a wedding can hop on the internet superhighway and stop off at any of a dozen ordination sites and for $34.99 can print off a certificate affirming them as a representative of God. But deep down we all know there is something more to this office or calling than a piece of paper. It's more than the vestments they wear, the education they possess, the office they hold, or their eloquence of speech. Society may place a clergyman on a special category simply because of a denominational affiliation, but that is not a true indicator that a minister is a divine ambassador. Some may measure the validity of a minister by the people they lead. There are those that would look at a megachurch pastor and equate authenticity of his divine call by the enormous number that congregate each week to hear him. At the same time, there are others that believe just the opposite. The more sparse the spiritual leader's following and the less appealing his message is to the masses, the more he is seen as one who has not sold out to the lure of popularity, clearly affirming him as being the messenger of God. But even these methods leave the weighing of the minister in the scales of fallible and faulty human perception. The only true and clear measuring stick for a Christian leader is the Word of God. In varying places in sparse wording, the Bible gives a sketch of a pastor. It lays out the character and the conditions for a pastor along with its requirements and its responsibilities. History has given us many examples of what it means to be the servant of God. Great men that have led dynamically, spoken to large crowds, written great books, and took memorable stands. But there are a select few that have paid for the privilege of leading the flock of God with their life's blood. Shepherds who have literally laid down their lives for their sheep. There is one, almost forgotten to history, who exhorted and encouraged his fold to be true to the Word of God no matter what, and then sealed that testimony with his own blood. I'm Ronnie Brown, and this is Forgotten. We're not privy to much of the early life of Roland Taylor. We know that he was born in Northumberland, the northernmost county of England, on October the 6th, 1510. We know nothing of his conversion. He was born just prior to the era of the Reformation, and through the testimony of his later days of life, we know that he believed in salvation by grace and through faith, the bedrock of Reformation teaching. We know something of his education. In 1530, he graduated from Cambridge University with a bachelor's degree in civil and canon law. And in 1534, he received his doctorate in the same discipline. After serving in various roles, Dr. Taylor was presented to the church at Hadley in Suffolk County, England, and became their pastor in 1544. He would remain this church's pastor until his death in 1555. The years of Roland Taylor's ministry were during a time of great political upheaval. In 1547, King Henry VIII died. His successor, King Edward VI, died in 1553. These two kings did much for the acceptance of Protestants in society. Their persecutions were limited during the reign of Henry VIII, and King Edward VI abolished the requirement of clerical celibacy in the Catholic Mass. But with the death of King Edward VI and the ascension of Queen Mary I, all these reforms were reversed. She wanted to reestablish Catholicism in England, vowing to weed out and burn every Protestant in England. And with this drastic change in political power, Roland Taylor found himself in the crosshairs of persecution. Roland Taylor proved to be a wonderful and beloved pastor to the people of Hadley, Hadley was about 70 miles outside of London and not really the place for one to make a name for themselves. Author R.C. Ryle, while writing on Taylor, said, If you want to be popular as a preacher, this is not where you go to serve. 
but serve there he did in exemplary fashion. Whereas the practice of many in that time was to take the house and the farm given to support the minister, rent it out to farmers, and live a life totally detached from the people of his charge, Dr. Taylor lived and served among the people of Hadley. One historian said, He was a right and glorious image or pattern of all the qualities that Paul brings out in 1 Timothy 3 of a godly minister of Christ's church. He was the good salt of the earth. He was a light in God's house set upon a candlestick for all good men to imitate and follow. End quote. He had a fierce love for his flock and diligently instructed them through the faithful teaching of God's word. He would not let even the smallest gathering of his church disperse without teaching them some aspect of God's saving grace. He was also approachable, gentle, and caring, giving to those in want, attending to the needs of the sick and the infirmed. Even when his enemies would insult him, he would return their scorn with words of love. And at the same time, he never shied away from stout rebuke to the rich and powerful who stood in need of correction. It was this love for the church that would initiate a conflict that eventually led to the taking of his life. With the ascension of Queen Mary and her overturning of the previous reforms in favor of Protestants, certain people of Hadley saw it as their chance to reestablish Catholicism in the town. They went into the chapel at Hadley and with a constructed altar and all the necessary implements and garments began to conduct a Catholic Mass. The Catholic Mass is a repudiation of the sufficiency of Christ and it is an idolatrous practice. The men conducting the Mass knew that there would be opposition and set armed guards to prevent anyone from interfering with the ritual. Roland Taylor heard the church bells ringing and assumed that he was needed at the church. He arrived finding the doors of the chapel locked. Gaining entrance through the chancel door, he found the men performing the mass surrounded by guards with drawn swords. Taylor shouted, You devil! How dare you enter this church of Christ and profane and defile it with this abominable idolatry? One of the men said, You traitor, why are you disturbing the queen's proceedings? I'm not a traitor, Taylor responded. I am the shepherd of this flock, and with every right to be here, I order you, you popish wolf, in the name of God, leave. Don't poison Christ's flock with your idolatry. It wasn't long before the guards forcibly escorted Dr. Taylor from his church. This incident was quickly reported to Stephen Gardner, the Bishop of Winchester. Gardner sent a summons to Taylor, and despite the townspeople's desperate pleas for Taylor to flee, he boldly appeared before the bishop. As soon as Taylor appeared before him, Gardner lit into him with insults, calling him basically a criminal, a traitor, and a heretic, among other names. Dr. Taylor patiently withstood the abuse, then calmly responded, My Lord, I am not a traitor or heretic, but a true subject and Christian. I came here at your command. Why did you send for me? Are you come as a villain? Gardner sneered. How dare you look at me in the face? Don't you know who I am? To which Taylor replied, Yes, I know who you are. You are Dr. Stephen Gardner, Bishop of Winchester and Lord Chancellor, and yet but a mortal man. But if I should be afraid of your lordly looks, why fear ye not God, the Lord of us all? You have forsaken the truth, denied our Savior, Jesus Christ, and His Word, and gone against your oaths. With what countenance will you appear before the judgment seat of Christ and answer to the oath you made first to King Henry VIII and afterward unto King Edward VI, his son? As you can imagine, these words did not sit well with the Bishop of Winchester. Roland spent the next two years in prison. During that time, there were so many Protestants and preachers committed into prison that it took on a university atmosphere. Dr. Taylor spent much of his time in the next two years praying, reading, and studying the scriptures. Two years in chains, two years in deplorable conditions, two years with little food, and yet this pastor's resolve was unbroken. 
He adamantly refused to relinquish the truth of God's word, even though it would, in the end, cost him his life. In February of 1555, Taylor was set to be transferred from London back to Hadley. He was set to be executed before the very people he loved and served as pastor. The night of his leaving London, he was allowed to secretly have dinner with his wife and children. As his wife Margaret left that night, she knew that he'd be leaving sometime before morning. She and her two daughters hid themselves outside the prison and waited until the wee hours of the morning, hoping to see him once more. At around two in the morning, Roland appeared with guards outside the prison. Elizabeth, their 13-year-old daughter, who they adopted when she was parentless at three, cried out, Oh, dear father, mother, mother, here is my father led away. Margaret then cried, Roland, Roland, where art thou? It was pitch dark outside. No lanterns were lit during the prison transfer. Dr. Taylor responded, Dear wife, I'm here. Margaret came running with Elizabeth and their younger daughter, Mary. They crumpled to the ground in an embrace. The sheriff allowed them a few moments to say their goodbyes. There, kneeling on the ground, Roland led them in the Lord's Prayer. As they stood, sobs could be heard among the guards and the sheriff himself. Roland said to his no doubt tear-filled wife, Farewell, my dear. Be of good comfort, for I am quiet in my conscience. God shall stir up a father for my children. Then he kissed his daughter Mary and said, God bless thee and make thee his servant. Then he turned and kissing Elizabeth said, God bless thee. I pray you all stand strong and steadfast unto Christ and his word and keep you from idolatry. In his last will and testament, Roland further said to his wife and family, The Lord gave you unto me. And the Lord hath taken me from you, and you from me. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I believe that they are blessed which die in the Lord. God careth for sparrows and for the hairs of our heads. And I have ever found him more faithful and favorable than any father or husband. Trust ye therefore in him. By means of our dear Savior Christ's merits, believe, love, fear, and obey him. Pray to him, for he hath promised to help. Count me not dead, for I shall certainly live and never die. I go before, and ye shall follow after to our long home. The following night, as the company stayed in the inn, which is called Woolsack, Dr. Taylor's servant, John Hull, brought his young son, Thomas, to see him. The boy was seated on a horse next to Taylor as the father lifted his eyes to heaven and prayed for God's blessing on his son. Over the next few days, as they traveled to Hadley, Dr. Taylor was joyful and happy. He readily engaged his guards, endeavoring to convert them to Christ. When he was informed that they would be returning to Hadley, Roland then prayed, O good Lord, I thank thee that I shall yet once more before I die see my flock, whom thou, Lord, knowest that I most heartily loved and truly taught. Good Lord, bless them and keep them steadfast in your word and in your truth. Before they arrived, Taylor's head was hooded to obscure his face from the people that would begin to congregate at his arrival. As the company rode into Hadley, although no one could see his face, many were sure it was their faithful pastor. The townspeople lined the streets, weeping and crying for the fate of their pastor. One poor man and his five children came and knelt at the side of the road and prayed, God, help and comfort thee as thou hast many a time come to my aid and help my poor children. Others cried out, Oh, good Lord, there goeth our good shepherd from us that so faithfully hath taught us and so fatherly hath cared for us and so godly hath governed us. Oh, merciful God, what shall we poor scattered lambs do? During their route to the commons where he was to be executed, 
Taylor insisted that they stop by the almshouse, a place where the poorest of the poor found help. It was a place in which Dr. Taylor's ministry had taken him many a time before. It was there Dr. Taylor took the remaining coins of his possession, monies that were given to sustain him in prison, and placed them in a glove and tossed them through the window. When they arrived at the commons outside the church, Taylor was unsure as to where they were. One of the guards told him that he was outside his parish church in Hadley. It was then Taylor said, Thanks be to God, I'm home. It was then that the hood was removed and the crowd burst into emotion. His head had been notched and clipped so as to ridicule his appearance. But the crowd with sobs and tears began to encourage their pastor. God save thee, good Dr. Taylor. Jesus Christ strengthen thee and help thee. The Holy Ghost comfort thee. In preparation for his burning, much of his clothing was removed. When he removed his boots, he summoned a familiar face from the crowd and handed the boots to him, likewise with his coat and shirt. When he finished, he said to those gathered, Good people, I have taught you nothing but God's holy word, and those lessons I took out of the Holy Bible. Today I come to seal it with my blood. A guard, having enough of his talk, struck him in the head. As he approached the stake, he knelt to pray, at which point a woman burst from the crowd to pray with her pastor. As she knelt down beside him, the guards tried to thrust her away, threatening to run over her with the horses, but she would not be moved. Finally, he arose from praying. He walked to the stake and there kissed it. He stepped into the pitch barrel they had provided for him to stand in and folded his hands with his eyes locked on the heavens. And as he prayed, an antagonist from the crowd threw a piece of wood at Taylor, striking him on the head and bloodying his face. Dr. Taylor responded to the injury by saying, Oh, friend, I have harm enough. What needed that? As Roland Taylor stood, bound to the stake, he recited the 51st Psalm. As he did so, he was struck in the lips and demanded to recite the scripture in Latin. It was then that a fire was kindled. Dr. Taylor, lifting up both hands toward heaven, called upon God, saying, Merciful Father of heaven, for Jesus Christ, my Savior's sake, receive my soul into thy hands. It was then that one of the guards, either out of malice or mercy, struck Roland Taylor on the head with a halberd, a long axe-type weapon, crushing his skull and killing him instantly. His body went limp and fell over into the flames that grew higher and higher. And yet in that exact same moment, his soul and spirit was received into glory, no doubt with the words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. As with so many others of the Christian faith, there is little left to stir the memory of this faithful pastor. He wrote no books. His sermons are lost. No school bears his name. Only a single, barely legible marker, obscured by tall weeds, placed at the location of his death, records his memory. He is all but nearly forgotten. But what we do have of him is enough to produce a benchmark, a measuring stick for any would-be pastor or minister. The boldness of his conviction and his unwavering obedience to the revealed truth are desperately in short supply when compared to this relativistic situational ethic of the present day. And yet this was tempered with an earnest love and a gentle humility and made him a Christ-like example for any generation. He is one indeed that walks in the footsteps of the Lord Jesus, one that giveth his life for the sheep. Forgotten is written and produced by me, Ronnie Brown. 
You can find out more about this show at ForgottenPodcast.com. And as always, thanks for listening.